Listen, grab your Bibles. We want to continue with this series on love and relationships and taking our relationships to the next level, uh, being able to interact with one another in the way that God would have us to do so. Uh, one of the things we need to be mindful of is that we were created and we need fellowship. Amen? You absolutely have to be able to get along with one another. Psalms 119, the first verse. Psalms 119 and 1. Psalms 119, 1, I'm going to read from the New King James Version. And the word of the Lord reads, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. For the sake of a subject this morning, I want to talk about the rules of engagement. Somebody say the rules of engagement. Neighbor, Neighbor, you do know, you do know there, are there are rules. rules. Amen. Amen. Every head bowed. Father, I thank you for this wonderful assembly of believers. But more than that, more than believers, their family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, Lord God, that we're in this place because we want to learn to love better. We want to learn to relate to one another, to be a blessing to one another. We want our relationships to be strengthened, our partnerships and covenants to be strong. And so, Lord God, as our hearts and minds are prepared right now, we pray that you will speak to us, give us instruction, divinely inspire us, that our connections, Lord God, will be that much better, and the love that your kingdom demonstrates, Lord God, in heaven will be replayed and reflected here on the earth. And all in agreement with that prayer, shout amen. Give God praise. Don't high-five your neighbor. Still flu season. Just give God praise. Amen, amen. <laughs> Somebody say rules of engagement. When you think of that phrase, one of the first uh, connotations or contexts that come to mind with rules of engagement is in time of war. And in times of war, rules of engagement, they define the circumstance, situations, or condition, or even the degree and the manner of which force or actions that might be considered provocative could be applied. Even in the chaos and the fog of war, there are rules. Uh, there's something called the Geneva Convention, and they govern uh, wartime circumstances and situations. Even companies that are, are countries who are at odds with one another still, watch this now, govern themselves in a set of rules, even in conflict. How much more should we have rules in conflict that we should not have rules, watch this now, in our connections and covenant agreements and arrangements with one another? Now, in relationships, the rules of engagement, they outline the circumstances, conditions, and degree and manner in which we interact with our fellow man. And these rules and these rules of engagement will help us in every relationship, as I said last week, from kinship to fellowship and every relationship relationship in between. How many of you know if you live your life by a set of rules, you can kind of keep yourself out of or even extricate yourself from unhealthy relationships? How many of you all know that a lot of our emotional and spiritual health, health is tied to who and what we're connected to? Some of us, if truth be told, you can trace a lot of your emotional discomfort or dysfunction to people you connected to or, watch this, allowed in your space. And so one of the things that it is imperative from a spiritual perspective is that we kind of govern ourselves with some rules, some guidelines on how we interact with one another, how we protect ourselves, and how we can be a blessing to others. And so this morning, I, I want to be didactic in my presentation. I don't want to be sermonic. Uh, didactic simply means to teach. It means to just lay out some principles and precepts. These things uh, shouldn't make you shout too much, but it ought to make you think. And it ought to get you in a place and a place and a position in your interaction, whether it's at home, interaction in, at work, at school, wherever you encounter people. If we can learn certain things, uh, we'll find ourselves uh, taking our relationships and ability to identify who we should or should not be in relationship with going to another level. How many of you know uh, filling folks out is difficult? Come on, because we live in an age where people aren't really what they seem. 
we are so hungry for authenticity. As we review a little bit from last week, we understand that the bedrock of our relationships is our connection to God and then our authenticity with ourselves. If we can get those two areas shored up, then and only then are we ready to have interaction with other people. Listen, stop infecting folk when you're sick yourself. Oh, I, can't, I can't talk to nobody else. So connect ourselves to God, get a sense of our identity, and then move to the next level and be authentic about ourselves. Know what you're called to. You, as a husband, can't find a help meet if you don't know what you need help for. Uh, I can't talk to nobody. You don't know if you're unequally yoked if you haven't properly assessed what standard or level you own. How will you know who you need to connect with if you hadn't been honest and transparent with yourself about where you are? Take care of those things first. And sometimes we get it backwards. We fall in love, we get in relationships, and then we find ourselves. And the next thing you know, you're connected with somebody you don't know. Or you drift apart. And all of a sudden, the person you've been around, you say, who are you? I just got real quiet. Because some people can, I think, really relate to that. And so even for those of us, if you're single in this place, raise your hand. Really, 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 really pay attention. Because you can keep yourself out of a whole lot of drama. If you could just get on... Uh, it catch a couple of these things, and I'm really speaking to you, but I'm also speaking to those who are married, those who've been divorced, or those who are in a situation. <laughs> Anybody, I say, I'm single, or I, I'm not married, I'm not divorced, but I'm, I, I, it's complicated. <laughs> Come on, that's a new thing right there. You got to add that down. You're in a situation, I'm complicated. See how my relationships are set up right now? <laughs> and, and so... But th th these principles or laws are pretty universal, and so I'm kind of going to walk through them. I'm not going to be real deep, but I'm going to give them to you in a way that I hope you can kind of apply to relationships and our interaction with one another. And so they will serve as a guide for who we connect with. Be nice and kind to everybody. But everybody is not a person you should be in covenant with or a person you should be connected with. Everybody can't be your friend in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. So how do we connect? Blessed are the undefiled in the way. He who walks in the law of the Lord. Two things that are powerful here. Number one, well, really three. Uh, there is a state of blessedness that comes from a place and space of integrity and wholeness. Uh, not drifting far away from the things of God. I'm standing before you and I'm a living witness. When your life is in line with God, when your life is in order, everything is fine. That doesn't mean you're not going to have troubles and struggles. But when you drift from God, life goes off the rails. Is there anyone who can attest to that? You had seasons in your life where you drifted from God and all Hades broke loose in your life. And it's nobody else's fault but yours. And so we have to keep that connection because along with that connection with God comes favor. When we constantly and consistently seek to align ourselves with God, we're keeping ourselves on a path that keeps, uh, watch this, unnecessary drama from us. The second thing that we find in here is the undefiled in the way. It is imperative that we try as much as we can with all of our heart, mind, and soul to live a life of integrity and wholeness. Uh, no one is perfect, but we should always endeavor to keep ourselves unsullied, to keep ourselves cleansed, because it is such a work and process to get yourself back together once you've gone down a bad path. I'm talking to some people in this place, and I'm talking to you from experience. It is difficult to be free from the shame of sin. It's difficult, but not impossible, because the blood still works. Ah, uh, but I want to tell somebody, don't follow in the footsteps of those who made a mistake. See the things that they've done wrong and avoid them at all costs. Sometimes we have to go through stuff for us to learn our own lessons. You could tell a baby the iron is hot, and you say hot, and that baby's going to do what? Touch that iron. But now that baby knows iron is hot. 
It's a lesson that they've learned. So sometimes we have to go through things, but other times if we could just follow principles and precepts and not go down the same path that those who've made a mistake, but not judge them, but learn from their mistake, especially those who are being transparent and will tell you, I ain't always been holy. Amen. And always had it all together. But it is all of our desire to make sure that in everything we do, we are trying to be unsullied and undefiled in the way. That walk in the law of the Lord. Now that word law there, I'm not going to try to uh, mess up my flow right now and trying to pronounce the word. But it simply means principles, precepts, and tenets that are derived from God through his word. He gives us a road map of how we ought to function. Life in not hard if you follow directions. It's, 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 uh, all my fathers in here have ever tried to put a bicycle together? Raise your hand. Or put anything that come in a box together now. In, anything, 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 anything. There used to be a time when you can kind of look at something and you figure out how to put it together. Not anymore. Not with Ikea and all them parts they have putting in there. You have to humble yourself. Okay, how many tools you got? I know how to do this. I'm a handy man. You better sit down, open the package, lay out the parts, read the instructions before you start trying to put something together. You might get it looking like a semblance of what is there, but the thing you're going to discover, if you don't follow instruction, watch this now, you're going to end up with something that don't function like the picture or it looks like the picture and automatically it thinks it functioning but when you look over there there's some stuff that's been left out and usually the stuff that's been left out is there not for aesthetics but for your own safety and well-being I can't get nobody to talk to me in here I can give you an example. Some of us have bought furniture like a chest or drawer and you put everything together but there's one little piece of equipment in there that most of us just leave off. It's a little chain, a little steel rope and wall screws and anchor sockets that you're supposed to screw to the wall, anchor at a stud and then attach to the drawer. You might think, I don't need that but every now and then you might have a child opening a drawer that the weight is just not right and the whole thing can tip down on about how many of you be sure that sometimes something seemingly so insignificant you leave it out but that one thing oh, come on now is the safety net between tragedy and watch this now triumph and so uh, somebody needs to understand we've been given instructions and we absolutely need to follow them. So there, there are certain laws. We, we are a, a, a society and a, and a world that's governed by laws. In the United States, we say we are governed by the rule of law. Uh, in, in nature, there's laws that cannot be uh, undone. The law of gravity, what goes up? must come down. There are laws of thermodynamics. There's laws in physics. There are certain things that no matter what circumstance or situation that you're looking at, there are certain principles and precepts that remain true. And if you follow them, watch this now, you read the results. But if you deviate, you find yourself uncharted territory and where you don't want to be. So the first law in relationships that you got to always look for is what we call the law of love. Say the law of love. Everything starts with that. Everything starts with the law of love. The Bible tells us that the law of love is the litmus test for true discipleship. Somebody say litmus test. Litmus test can be, have two contexts. Uh, some of us remember in science we had litmus paper. Remember those little strips of litmus paper and you would dip it into certain substances and if it turned one color, it was acidic. If it turned another color, it was a base. And so it was the litmus test. And so you transfer that over to something else. And a litmus test simply means that there is a singular specific indicator that leads you to a conclusion. So the Bible tells us that love is a litmus test for true discipleship. See, if this element is present, then watch this now, discipleship is present. Right. Jesus tells us in an even more profound way that you always got to look for love. He says in John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35, can I just teach a little bit? He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, watch this, here's the litmus test. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love 
love for one another. See, before you get into a relationship with somebody and somebody you want to connect with, you ought to watch their love walk. Their ability, he says, because that's the litmus test. If you want to be in a loving relationship, there got to be some love in and on them at some point in their life. And you can sit back and watch how they interact with one another. People can say they're religious. They can say they're saved. We can say we go to church. But here's the thing you have to understand. Jesus says the litmus test for whether you want to mind is the love you have for one another. See, you want to, first thing you got to start watching with folk is how they interact with people, how they connect with people, how they treat folk. And as you can discern that, that will line up with what they profess to be about themselves. I'm saved. I love the Lord. But if you mean and nasty, there's a disconnect. Oh, come on, talk to me in here. So the first thing we understand is love is the litmus test for our discipleship from God. The other thing about love is love is, watch this now, the purest form of exercising our faith. Uh, as a Christian, as a believer, you can't get more profound in your demonstration of your connection to God than your ability to have love and compassion and caring for everybody. Now, this is difficult because the moment I say everybody, you start thinking about one, two, three, four, five people that you don't put in that loop right now, that you, you got in a different category. But even in God, he tells us that even our enemies deserve our love. Now, there's different kinds of love. There's agape, there's philo, there's philo, philo, uh, uh, philo, philadelphia, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> got tongue tied. And then there, there's brotherly love, there's eros, an erotic love that should be confined in the confines of covenant. There's certain degrees of love, but all of us should extend agape love to all mankind. And, and, but in the midst of that, sometimes we find that difficult, but that's the purest expression of our connection to God. Love. It is a commandment that's so powerful that God says that you should love me with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. And he says when he's asked, Jesus did, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 through 40, when he was tested uh, by scribes and Pharisees trying to catch him and hem him up. I don't know why you try to take the word and him up the word with the word. That's just a crazy thing. But they said, but when a Pharisee heard that he was silencing uh, the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, who was a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, talking to Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now here's the the key verse 40 on these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets everything everything rests on our love for God and one another you want to simplify the Bible have anybody ever thought about man this Bible sometimes can be difficult to read and simple and not so simple to understand the greatest way to simplify the totality of these 66 books of the Bible is these two laws give God the love that he deserves love him with everything in you and the second one he says is like unto it equal to is like unto it love your neighbor as yourself on these two laws two commandments hang all of the prophetic teaching, all the scripture, everything rests on that. Get that right, everything else comes in line. And, and so if you really stop and examine that, that's the purest form. Love is the purest form of our, our connection to God. But that's the place we fail the most. Uh, in the last four or five years, I have never seen so many loveless church folk. I just, I, and, and do I have a witness? I just, I just, and, and so we fail at this first law of loving God and loving one another. That's what you have to look for. Ladies, look at a man. He said, I love you, but watch him love his mama. Oh, I can't, I can't get no fat. Watch him love his kids. Watch him do things and how he interacts with other people because that's going to be an indication of his capacity for loving you. Mm, mm, I can't get, can't get nobody to talk. Can't get nobody to talk to me up in here. And so that law of love, it is a litmus test for somebody who's truly connected. You can ask somebody, you say you go to church? Yes. Okay, the test ain't over. 
test is not over. It just got started. Now you got to watch and pray and then pray and watch and lotus all of these interactions in between because these connectedness and the interactions that they have with outside people is going to be an indication of how they're going to interact with you. It is the purest form of exercising our faith. It all starts with love. The second law that helps us govern our relationships. And, and, and I might spend a little more time here. I don't know. But we get the law of love, but we also need this law called boundaries. Somebody say boundaries. One of the things the Bible tells us is that you should guard your heart at all costs, for out of it flows the issues of life. Uh, it is something that's true to that. We need boundaries. Boundaries define us. And when you think about boundaries, boundaries uh, helps me know what's me, what's not me. What's my responsibility and what's not my responsibility? When you think about boundaries, you think about your property. If you're a homeowner, raise your hand. You, you own a home. Well, one of the things you have at your home is that you have a property line. Right? Uh, you have a property line, and that property line simply distinguishes between you and your neighbor what's your property and what's their property. When you clearly distinguish what's your property, you understand what your responsibility is. Now, if you do anything within your property, you're within your rights because you're in the boundaries of your property. Uh -huh. Step outside of the boundaries of your property, you're encroaching. Uh -huh. Come on, talk to somebody. On someone else's property. Now, if we can translate that from property to our personhood, to our life and our interaction with one another, it helps us because one of the things that sometimes you can be the most loving Christian and person on the earth, but you can have one flaw, and that is you don't know how to say no. no. I, I, I found myself in this place not knowing how to say no, wanting to say no. How many of you wanted to say no? My mind said no, my spirit said no, <laughs> but my body said I, I can't get nobody to talk to him. I wish I wish I had I wish I think I got some real folk over up in here, but I, I I'm just trying to see, make sure anybody ever had that disconnect? Your mind and your spirit is in one place with your body. And so you have to understand there's boundaries, boundaries in relationships, boundaries in, in uh, uh, relationships in marriage, boundaries in relationships in the workplace. We're seeing this now come up in our society where uh, leaders and those who work with them and those are who are in relationships and, that are supposed to be professional and are platonic and they become something else is because we lose track of boundaries. And the wonderful thing about them is that you understand it's difficult sometimes to see boundaries because most boundaries can't be seen unless you stake them. How many of you still got your, the, the stakes of the original survey of your property line? You just keep them there for reference. And sometimes we got to have some stakes in our personal life so that we can know some boundaries that we don't cross or we don't allow anyone else to cross. Because if you don't establish boundaries, you don't know what's yours, you'll end up taking on problems that's not yours or becoming a problem for somebody else. I can't get nobody to talk. That's what happens when you find yourself in a relationship with people who drain you. you do you anybody in here know some folk that just suck the life out of you? Listen, listen, I, listen, just the fact that I start speaking that, you start thinking of a person's name and you got tired. Come on, you got tired right then. I'm just... Lord Jesus, I'm tired. It's hot in here. This person just drains me. Is there anybody? Let me come over here. Is anybody here? Every time you come, they come and they ask it for something. They need something. Can you help me? It's always about me. And I want to suggest to you, you might not like what I'm saying. They ain't the problem. Come on, come in. I'm, I'm I ain't talking about just friends and coworkers that get on your nerve, bringing you work you ain't supposed to be doing, but because they won't do their job, they want you to do their job and their job. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about, watch this now, family. How many of you know family can drain you, suck you dry? Because we have this innate obligation to love God and love one another. But you need to understand there's a law called boundaries. Now watch this. Now there's some stuff I got to handle over here. And there's some stuff you need to handle over there. I'm going to say boundaries. But, but there's, a con there's a conflict. There's a conflict because ingrained in our nature, we have the first law. But I I'm, not, I'm not here to tell you that they're in competition. They're not in conflict. The first law is to love God and love one another. 
But, but then sometimes you feel like, well, I have to have boundaries. I have to say no. There are certain things I'm responsible for. But I, I shouldn't I help my fellow man? Yes, these, these two laws aren't in conflict, but we have to understand how to put them in perspective. Come here, Paul. Come here, Paul. Paul says, all right. And Paul, uh, epistle to the church at Galatia, in Galatians, he writes this very familiar passage of Scripture. In Galatians chapter 6, verse number 2, he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Someone is overtaken in the fault. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. Bear one another's burdens and uh, so fulfill the law of Christ. That's the law of Christ. That's a law. The Christ law that I just read, the law of Christ, love God and love one another. If you see someone with a burden, something going on in their life that's heavy, uh, help them, reach out to them. That word burden is transliterated literally with an oppression, something they can't carry for themselves. But here's the part that helps make sure that boundaries and love don't compete with one another because you got to keep on reading the verse number five. For each shall bear his own load. Here, here, there's, there's where it is. So say, say we have boundaries. This is things that I'm responsible for. There are things that you're responsible for. But watch this now. When I keep the first law in mind that I love God and love one another, if I see you got a burden so heavy that it's oppressive and you can't care, you don't have the capacity to help yourself, then as a believer, one who is spiritual, I'm obligated to watch this now, reach over into your space. I have permission to cross that boundary and assist you because your boundary and your pack and your load has become a burden. But everybody got to carry their own load. Can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I paint the picture? I'm a soldier and this is a soldier. I got a 50-pound 50 50 pack. You got a 50-pound pack. That's your load. That's my load. Now, if you ain't injured and I'm not injured, don't ask me to carry your load. I, I, can't, I can't talk to nobody. So, so in an instance right there, when somebody say, can, can you help me? I don't feel like carrying that load. Now, you can still love God and you can love them and say no. Because you got a load, I got a load, all God's children got a load. <laughs> y'all ain't not talk with me. <laughs> but what happens is sometimes we're so busy trying to help somebody with a problem that we don't understand that the best thing could happen to them that they have a problem. Because we create codependency when we're carrying somebody's low that they're supposed to carry themselves because everybody has a low. You got a low, but if somebody's got an oppressive burden, that's a different thing. And we reach there to help them, but it ain't meant to be permanent. There ought to be a start date and an end date. I'm, I'm moving you to a place where you help yourself. How many of you have had folk supposed to stay for a week? And that was 1989. Just look straight ahead. Just look straight ahead. Where we... <laughs> we we was no, no boundaries. Ladies, ladies, y'all got a lot going on. You, you work, you got to take care of children, you come, you're going to school, you're running small businesses, and then you have your schedule laid out, and then there's going to be inevitably people that are going to come and try to encroach on your time. I need to help Junior with this science project. But while I'm helping Junior with this science project, sister girlfriend comes over unannounced, didn't call, and wants you to talk to her and make her feel good. And if you tell her, well, I, I really got to help so-and-so with her homework. And, and they go, well, I thought that's what friends were for. That when we in time or need that you would be right there. But that's all right. I will go in. But see, if you don't know boundaries, you'd be like, all right, girl. Now you putting your stuff on hold, dealing with her situation. But if you understand boundaries, you say, my fess responsibility is to this house I got to get this done now if next time if you call for you come and have enough respect for my house and my time friend friend y'all y'all didn't hear the y'all didn't hear what I said I'm trying to help somebody I'm trying to help somebody say no Can I, can I be transparent, men? Some of us men, we sure don't know nothing about boundaries. 
That's where my brother starts sitting up. We, I, I tell you myself, I'd be the first one sometimes not to miss a boundary. And, and in relationships, when you're going through things, don't let friendships cause you to cross over into all right now. Yes. You preach it now, Pastor. I'm, 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 I'm talking to you. I, I just... Men and women, we can't be friends. No, that's right. You can be as saved as you want to be. That's just a boundary you don't need to be. You be an associate, but uh -uh, we can't. Uh -uh, no, I'm not your friend. You're just a female I know. Some of y'all say, well, I can handle it. All right, keep playing with that. Keep playing. You keep playing with that. And then I'm going to have a private talk with you. That is a boundary we don't need to cross. I'm 53 years old. I got I got uh, uh, testimony. Don't cross those boundaries. Keep them separate. When you get married, you ain't got time for friends of the opposite sex. Right, 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 right. I'm just look. I'm look. I'm standing flat-footed in my 13s. And telling you what I know, you just can't do it. But we've been friends all our life. When you leave your father and mother, you need to leave Pukwana too. That don't mean be disrespectful. Like, Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. But I'm telling you what I know. Those connections become corrupt and it will lead you down a place of destruction. So we have to identify those burdens. People, I mean boundaries. People that you are friends with don't necessarily mean you need to be business partners with. Because once you pass that boundary between our fidelity and finances, and you try to step up, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. The quickest way to destroy a relationship is to cross the money boundary. I have this rule. I don't lend money. If I can't afford to give it to you and you have it, I just, I, I don't have it. Because that's a boundary that once that start crossing, friendship and finances, as long as you ain't got that money, when you meet and cross paths, you sing a Rihanna song with your saved self. I ain't going to say nothing else. Y'all know the song. Somebody say, better have my money. You say. Look, I keep it all the way 100. Listen, y'all done had enough fake, phony people in front of y'all. You come to I Thrive, I'm going to keep it real up in here. I'm too old to fake it. certain laws, there's certain lines you just should not cross. Some of us have awkward times at Christmas and Thanksgiving because uh, somebody owe you money. Isn't that awful? They owe you money and, and you gave it to them last Thanksgiving. <laughs> this Thanksgiving, they coming up here showing you they bag. I secured the bag. You better secure my money. Somebody say boundary. You don't cross them. It'll help you say no. There's a law of love, law of boundaries. Guard your heart at all costs. Be, be loving, be kind, but know when to say no. 
Law number three, the law of agreement. Mm -hmm. Amos three and three. Can I? I'll, I'll preach this one. Mm -hmm. Can uh, two walk together except they be agreed? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> and and two walk together except they be agreed. They, if you're going to be round folk or connected to people or with them, there has to be agreement. Now, now hear this. A connection with people has to be based on a decision process. You have to take folk through process. We connect with folk and make them friends before interviewing them. And I'm not sitting down at across of a desk. But there got to be a process that has to have more depth to it than, watch this now, similar likes similar preferences, or your first encounter was smooth and there was no awkwardness. The connection has to be based on something with more depth than that. Uh, one of the things that has to happen is that you got to spend time, or enough time with an individual that you can discover, watch this now, their spiritual and moral ethos. How they think, how they process. And spend enough time with somebody to discover their core values. Right. Say core values. Okay. What's right, what's wrong. And, and, and I'm not saying that everybody's perfect because if we try to go look for people who are perfect, we would never, just, just my way, forget that. But they have to have similar core values. It has to go beyond surface conversation. We like sports. We like Philadelphia, we like the Falcons, or we like the same thing, or we have about the same amount of friends on social media. It got to be deeper than that. The core values, and so you have to start looking at things, and there's like four things you have to look for that helps you identify the integrity of a person, and when I say the integrity of a person, not meaning the perfection. Even the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, tells us that he wrestled with his flesh, uh, between his flesh and his spirit, but you can look for some people, and you can look for certain qualities in them and make sure they're aligned with you, and watch this now. Before you start looking for people of integrity, make sure you're one. Amen. Don't hold a standard for them you haven't held yourself to yet. And if you're not ready to hold yourself to that standard, leave people alone. And you missed a place to shout and clap. So here's what things kind of look for to see if you have agreement. Their desire and discipline to do what's right. Just, just kind of be around folk that they just try. They trying to do the right thing. They moving in that direction. Truth and honesty is important to them. That when you talk to them, you're not hearing two sides of the story. You're not getting fake news from them. So you look for people who are trying to do the right thing. Avoid, watch this now, people who like to live in gray areas. You need folk either black or white. I'd rather know you hate me. Just, just, I'd rather know you don't particularly care for me and you stay over there than to be in my face That's right. That's right. plotting. That's right. Stay away from folk in gray areas because uh, uh, shady people are uh, like the shade. Shade is comfortable for a while, but please understand nothing can grow without light. And you have to have both. And so avoid shady people who vacillate, who can easily, uh, watch this now, compromise. And there's no struggle for them because eventually they will cause you to compromise your walk. Stay away from shady folk, people who live in the gray area. Number three, uh, hang around people who are just pure. And what I mean by pure, not unselling, but uh, authentic, genuine, whose motives are pure. Sometimes people have shady motives. They really don't want you, they want who you're next to. Or, or, or that what you have, and as long as you have it, they're there with you. I, I, I found out that there were so many people who were with me because of... But the moment trouble came, 
Motives have to be pure. Are they seeking position? Are they seeking money? Are they seeking connection? Are they trying to get the hookup? You have to wait long enough to examine motives and connect with pure people. Here's another one. The pursuit of excellence. You, you want to be around folk who at least trying to go somewhere. Trying to do a little something, something. Just trying, you know, I, I, you know, everybody trying to make money moves. But you, 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 you need, look, you have not a high priest. I, I keep it real. Now, I, I know, I, I might not understand, but I know what's going on. Now, I know what's going on. But you need to be around some people who are trying to secure the bag. You need to be around some folk who are trying to make some moves and, and who are trying to go to the next level. You, you need some people who are trying to boss up and, and move in certain things. Because if excellence is what you're after, you can't hang out with mediocre folk. Yeah. 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 Are, are y'all? So, birds of a feather flock together. A chicken is a chicken and an eagle is an eagle. Ain't nothing wrong with the chicken and ain't nothing wrong with the eagle. But if I'm an eagle, I'll be doggone. If I'm sitting in a chicken coop with a chicken. I can't, I can't. Come on, talk to me up in here. You're supposed to be perched on the mountain, yes, sir. Yes, sir. and they cooped up, right. and you wonder why there's tension between you, because yes, you weren't made to be in a coop. Yes, you were made to. Yes, you need to get around and get away from folk that's dragging you and pulling you down and killing your dreams. Yes. Law of agreement. Uh. There he is. Uh -huh. Now, uh -huh. <laughs> law, law, law of love, law of boundaries, law of agreement. Law of loyalty. I ain't even gonna get, I'm just going to read scripture on this. I ain't even going to put my own commentary in. God requires loyalty. Jesus demands loyalty. And loyalty is a, ch is a choice that must be declared. You ought to hear it. First one, God requires loyalty. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 through 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to feel the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you today for your good. He says, listen, I require you to follow me, love me, follow my law, keep my commandments. I want loyalty. That's God. Jesus demands loyalty. Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Either you with me or you not. He said loyalty. And then loyalty got to be shouted. Joshua says this in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your father serve that were on the other side of the river or the god of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm looking at a church full of loyal people because there's a whole bunch of folks say, you still go there? You say, yes, I do. Because I know what loyalty looks like. Law of love. <laughs> law of boundaries. Law of agreement. The law of loyalty. And the law of mutual benefit. Bring something to the table. Bring 
something to the table. Bring something to the table. Very word relationship inquires involvement of two entities. Uh, true relationships is a state of being that when they are mutually connected, there's mutual benefit. Uh, come here, Coelith. Coelith is the preacher in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, I preached a message on this not long ago, but Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 4, verse 9 and 12 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if one fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if one lie down together, they'll keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? We all need to bring somebody. One person got body heat, but two people with body heat, that's a fire. Bring something to the table. Look for folk that fill you up and don't drain you. How do you know someone provides mutual benefit? Here's about five or six things you can kind of look for, and we're just going to stop. Uh, there's five or six things you can look for that people, that if there's a mutually beneficial relationship, you'll kind of see and discover these things. Number one, they'll inspire gratitude and not grief. You just feel good being around them, and you just feel happy. Uh, you're grateful. They just pull stuff out of you, uh, make you feel good. You see them coming. You're excited. Uh, you hit the phone ring. It's all good. You see them. You're like, what's up, bro? And that can be uh, uh, male relationships, female relationship. People just inspire gratitude. I'm just grateful for this connection. I'm thankful because uh, it, 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 there's reciprocity here. It's not, uh, and I'm doing it not to get something, but because we're connected, I feel better. Uh, they make you better. They hold you accountable. It's good to be around people who will check you. People say, you wrong. You crazy. You need Jesus. <laughs> I, see, you need people around you that pass the booger test. You, you do know what the booger test is, though. You need folk around you that if you got a booger in your nose, they don't let you walk all day. <laughs> this is mutual benefit. Now, you're going to be around me. If I got a booger, you be a tell me. I can't get, I can't get nobody to talk to me in this place. They love you enough to tell you the truth. Uh, watch this. They don't live in your past. Beware of people who always remind you of past That's failure. Right. That's right. Mutual of beneficial relationships. Watch this now. And, and I'm going to leave with this, with these laws. And we're going to leave out of here. And from this moment on, when folk come in, you're like, hey, you're like, no, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you got to take them through the laws. But this last one. Relationships that exemplify mutual benefit spark generosity in you. When you're in a mutual beneficial relationship, it makes you giving. It makes you a more giving person. Because you, you don't feel drained, you don't feel manipulated, you don't, you don't feel coerced. If you're around someone and there's a mutual benefit to that relationship, you just want to do stuff for them. It, it just makes you generous. It just makes you want to do things for That's how I, my, my wife, I just want to do stuff for her. Just, I don't want her to touch a dish or plate, pump gas. I want her to get to 10 years from now, she don't know how to pump gas no more because she ain't pumped none in so long. See, I just told you, you do not go to the gas station. Right. Right. Go to the gas station with your fine self. You better sit your little <laughs> self down. I'll go get the gas. You don't just... You sit down, I'll cook. Come on now. When, 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 and when you with that person, it just, I just want to do. And, and sometimes around the house, we be going at it like, oh, no, I'll get it. No, baby, you sit down. No, baby, no, you'll get it. No, you got to get the last thing. You just sit down. No, I'm not going to sit down. I'm going to get this. You, what is, that's a wonderful place to be. It just sparks this, 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 this desire to be generous. That's why when it's a mutual benefit, that's how you know. Operate with these law, uh, laws of relationships and our relationships will go to the next level. 
There's a law of love. That's the litmus test of your discipleship for God. There's a law of boundaries. Clearly know who you are and what you are responsible for. There is a law of agreement. Don't be connected with people that don't share your core values. There's a law of loyalty. Commit. Be unwavering in that support. Help people recover and be restored because one day you're going to fall down. And you need somebody to help you get back on your feet. The law of mutual benefit. Let people in your life bring something to the table, but don't demand that they bring something to the table and you hadn't brought nothing to the table. If blessed are those who are undefiled in the way and hold fast to the law of the, of the Lord. There's rules to engagement. Follow them, walk through them, and the quality of relationships will grow to the next level. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Did, that, did that help somebody today? Amen. Come on, stand to your feet. All of the building, stand to your feet. Well, I hope you feel generous. <laughs> but not quite yet. Relationships are key. But as we stated last week, the primary relationship that we need to get right is our relationship between ourselves and God. That connection with him. No man come to the Father except by our relationship with Jesus Christ. I always want to check that connection to make sure that everyone here is already saved. You, you've asked God to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart. If you're not saved, I want to give you an opportunity right now. I want to give my life to God. I want to connect to a God who loves me, loved me so much that he allowed his only begotten son to die on my behalf. He laid his life down. He laid his most precious gift down, his son, on my behalf for me to cleanse me of my past sins and to give me a future, to raise me up spiritually. And I want to connect with God today. If you're not saved, your, your spiritual existence depends on that connection with God. If I'm talking to anybody right now, I'm not saved. I want to give my life to the Lord. I want to connect to him. I want you to come right now. Amen. Secondly, if there's someone who says, I, I'm saved, but I don't have a church home. I want to join. I thrive Christian church. I want to connect. I want to be a part of this congregation. You understand that we are supposed to be the fellowship of believers, ecclesia, the called out ones. We're supposed to do things together. We we'll all be covered under a house. Everyone needs a preacher. They need a teacher. They need someone to share with them, to shepherd them, not to lord over them, but to guide them, not to be better than them, but to be on the same journey, but just a little bit ahead because they have a gift to teach and expound and to give inspiration and information that leads to spiritual manifestation. We have to release those things. And so if you want a church home, we'd love to have you be part of our Thrive Christian Church. And so if that's what you are feeling led to do, come right now. I'm going to connect to this church, and I'm going to be a part of our Thrive Church. I'm not a member, but I'm going to be one before I leave this place. Amen, amen, amen.